If you've been following my builds, you've probably noticed a trend where one of the first things I do is get the vehicle, or at least part of it, into the computer. I've done this a few different ways. With the S600, I had a really nice expensive scanner at work and nobody seemed to notice that I borrowed it for a weekend. With the Jag, I used an inexpensive LiDAR scanner from Intel, the L515. This was about 350 bucks. It worked okay, but it wasn't very good at tracking, so you had to scan things at least three times to get good data. For the land speed car, I was building almost everything, so the only scan I needed was the engine. Around that time, a company that makes scanners asked if I would like to review one of theirs, and I said, what a coincidence, I need to scan a thing. It worked great, but I concluded in that video that, for me anyway, it was definitely not worth the $10,000 price. 3D scanning and CAD modeling has been the next level in garage builds for a while, but all the solutions have their limitations. But now, things are starting to change, and consumer-grade scanners are becoming available that can do what they say they can do. And what they can do is make building things in your garage way easier and faster. One of those scanners is the Einstar, made by that same company that came out with the $10,000 scanner. I thought about asking if I could have a loaner to review it, but everything I read seemed really positive, so I just bought one. There are a handful of reviews out there on YouTube already, but most of them seem tied to a loaner and a discount code in the description, but not this one. This one is mine. This video is not supported by this company. It is sponsored, but not by the scanner company. It's sponsored by Brilliant, but we'll get to that in a minute. As for the scanner, I'm going to give you an objective good and bad, all while getting a 1999 Dodge Viper into the computer so we can make it go off-road. Also, if you're wondering why I like this so much, I'm going to spend some time explaining why it's so beneficial to have a scan and how I post-process the scan and use it in my designs. There are a few ways to get physical things into the digital world. In a previous video, I talked about the RevoPoint Pop Scanner, the Intel RealSense Scanners, the very expensive professional scanners, and I touched on some iPhone scanners. The problem with all of these solutions is that they are either not good enough or way too expensive. I've been waiting for years for a nice middle ground scanner. Ideally, it would be around 500 bucks, but we're probably a few years off from that. The Einstar comes in at about 1000 and it's pretty great. It does everything I need it to. The tracking is pretty good. Accuracy is perfect for me. The main drawback is the cost, both the scanner itself and the fact that you need a pretty serious computer to run it. I've been running it on a laptop, kind of. I bought this a while ago because I wanted a decent Windows desktop, but I also wanted the portability to take it out to the garage to tune ECUs and stuff like that. This is technically a laptop, but it's really just a slightly portable desktop with a built-in screen. It comes with two power supplies, one of them bigger than an iMac. You need to have both of these plugged in, otherwise the laptop will throttle itself and the scanning gets really choppy. Basically, you need a desktop unless you have a really stout CAD or gaming laptop lying around. This is going to be the tipping point for some people. If you have a computer that meets the specs for this scanner, then it might be worth it. But if you have to buy the scanner and the computer, maybe not. I've scanned so many things with this already. Basically, the whole Viper, suspension from four other vehicles, several little parts. Today, we're going to scan this Jeep Wrangler Rubicon rear axle. This came brand new from the factory, and it comes with free shower caps. Before you scan the first time, you have to calibrate. This is super easy. Most of the user interface on this is straightforward. It's simple enough to not need instructions, but still has most of the features you need. I won't dig too much into the nitty gritty. You're smart. You'll figure it out. This scanner, as with most scanners, loves complex geometry with lots of edges so it knows where it's at. It hates big flat or near flat things. It also loves rough, non-reflective, light-colored surfaces. It loves this brake caliper and rotor. It hates most of the rest of this axle. It has good geometry, but it's too black and shiny. It will scan if you're careful and real slow, but it's way easier to just turn that shiny black surface into a matte white surface. You can buy powder specifically for this. You can also use foot spray. The cheapest solution here is actually one of the best. Just mix one part baby powder with about four parts alcohol. You can be way off with this ratio and it still works, so don't worry about measuring it out. Just put your safety gear on, mix them together, and pour them into a spray bottle. You might want to use a funnel for this or not. Whatever, I'm not your dad. Once it's all in the spray bottle, spray down the whole part. After a couple of minutes, the alcohol will evaporate and you're left with a perfect surface for scanning. I do this for everything now. I don't even try to scan first, I just spray it with this stuff. 3D scanners love white powder. Use a lot. Use as much white powder as Robert Downey Jr. used in the 90s. Just don't stick it up your nose. Before you start your scan, you have to select your resolution. Somewhere between half and one millimeter will work well on this. If you need finer details, like very specific hole locations, you might want to go smaller. 
One limitation of this scanner that showed up on this axle, and really with most scanners, is that both of the sensors need to be able to see the surface to scan it, and not even just see it, but they need to be somewhat perpendicular to the surface. You don't have to be exactly facing it, but something like this probably won't scan. This makes it hard to get into crevices, but you can get a lot more geometry by just rotating the scanner around. LiDAR scanners don't have this problem, but you do lose accuracy with them. Sometimes it will pick up garbage data, but it's pretty good at ignoring it after the scan, so don't worry about it. You can also clean it up afterwards. You do need ambient light with this thing, it won't work in the dark, but it does come with its own lights. The scanner conveniently has buttons on the back to start and pause the scan and to adjust brightness and zoom. Going around corners is tough, this is a problem with most 3D scanners. To go from the top to the side of the axle, it helps to use something like a brake caliper as a transition. Repeating geometry like treads or wheels will often cause the scanner to lose its place, but this scanner is way better at keeping its place than some of the previous ones I've tried. Large flat areas like the trunk of the Viper won't scan at all unless you use targets. Targets are these reflective dots that are a pain to use and always seem to just be on the floor of my garage. I hate using targets, mostly because you have to have a ton of them, like way more than you think you need. This is not even remotely enough targets on the back here. But if you have a surface like this, you kind of just have to use them. I got a mediocre scan with this. To get a good scan, I'd need probably at least five times as many targets. Here's the really cool part about this scanner and the software. It's really good at aligning multiple scans. I could try to get the whole part in one scan, but that's a pain for a couple of reasons. The big one is that sometimes the scanner will lose its place and think it's somewhere else, and then it'll just add junk data on top of what you've already scanned, giving you two brake calipers when there should be one. My suggestion for a feature here would be for the software to have a button to undo the last 30 seconds of scanning, but you don't really need to do that as long as you periodically stop the scan and just start a new project. As long as both scans have some overlap, the software will automatically align them. So with the axle, I got four scans, two on the top, then I flipped it over, gently, then two on the bottom. After you flip over the axle, but before you start scanning the other side, you'll want to delete the garage floor and the dollies by tracing around them and deleting the highlighted data. Then add a new project and scan the other side. Once you have all of your scans, press this puzzle piece here and the software will allow you to automatically align all four of your scans. It does this two at a time. If it has trouble aligning two of the scans, you can help it along by manually picking three points that overlap on both scans. There is a lot of capability in this software for fixing your scans, stuff like filling holes or getting rid of floating parts. You gotta be careful with this because it's not the smartest about what to stitch together and what to get rid of. I did a scan of the rear suspension on a Jeep and told it to remove the floating parts and it just made the spring coils disappear, so I had to go back and adjust that. I don't seal anything up watertight because that lets the software make assumptions about missing data and it's usually not right. If you're doing 3D printing, you might need to dive more into this to get a watertight model. I'm somewhat glossing over the details here, partly because this software is pretty self-explanatory, but Making for Motorsport has a pretty good video that goes into some of the details. If you get one of these things, check out that video. It's also just best to play around with it. Once you get a good scan, you might realize that the file is gigantic and your puny computer can't handle all the polygons. This is where MeshLab comes in. MeshLab is free, but it's not intuitive at all, so if you're trying to do anything, be prepared to Google it, or Bing it, or ChatGPT it, or whatever your kids are doing these days. Open MeshLab, import your mesh, and use this simplification, and then make this number smaller. Something like 300,000 maybe? Click OK and wait to see what the new mesh looks like. You can immediately see the effect on the scan. If I put in a smaller number, you can see the fidelity on these bolts disappears, which could be a problem. Unfortunately, MeshLab does not have an undo, so if this happens, just close it without saving and reopen it. Try again with a larger number, and then export the mesh when you're happy. You might want to export as and pick a new file name so you can keep your old detailed scan just in case. There are a million things you can do in MeshLab, and I don't know what any of this stuff does. So if you find something useful, be sure to make an entertaining YouTube video about it so I can find it later. After that's done, pull the file into your preferred CAD software. The first thing I do is a measurement check on some known dimension to make sure I import it in the right units. I bring this up only because I always get it wrong. If not, just use the scale option to multiply or divide by 25.4. Fusion 360 lets you edit your imported meshes. Just right click on the mesh import down here and you can delete sections by painting or drawing boxes around anything you don't want. This was nice for the scans I did of the Bronco where I needed the tire and wheel to align the scan in CAD, but I didn't need it after that. The next thing you want to do is orient the model to the coordinate system so it's not all just willy-nilly floating in space. To do this, I usually get it close and then I draw a sketch over to measure how much further I need to move. I want this tube to be in line with the front plane, so I drew a line on the front plane, and then one on the edge of the tube, and then I pulled the dimension from that. Then I just rotated the model by that amount, and it's all lined up. Do this on all the axes, and you're good to go. <laughs> 
Now that you have the scan, you can start designing around it. There are a couple of ways to do this, the lazy way and the hard way. Guess which one I do. The hard way is to just redraw the whole thing. If you're working with a group of people or a really big CAD model, you might want to redraw the whole thing. This is kind of a pain, but it's much easier to use a solid model than a scan. I do this with simple stuff like the brake rotor or the hub. Although I usually still leave out geometry I don't need, a lot of people do this, which is why you see CAD files floating online that look like this. The lazy way, the way I do it, is much easier. Take this engine that I scanned for the land speed car. I need to connect four things to it. The frame, the intake, the exhaust, and the chain. So I went in and drew simple solids at the motor mounts, the intake and exhaust flanges, and the sprocket. Everything else is just there so I don't accidentally run a frame tube through the engine. I'm kind of doing the same thing on the solid rear axle. I need to attach the trailing arms, the pan hard bar, the shocks, the springs, and the drive shaft. So I'm just going to draw in features in those areas that have the correct geometry. This will make it easier to design things that attach to the rear end, and I still have the rest of the scan so I know if I'm going to interfere or collide with anything. There is a third way that I use the scan, and that's just kind of a hybrid. See this frame for the Viper? I scanned the underside of the car, and then I traced lines around the scan to make a solid frame. But it's not the whole frame. It doesn't have some of the small details here and there, so I'll use my solid model to make suspension mounts, but then I'll keep the scan handy so I can periodically check to make sure there's nothing significant in the way that I didn't model, like the old control arm mounts. This is where the scan comes in really handy. Things like the hub or rotor, I can just measure those and draw a CAD model. Maybe the scan saves a little bit of time, but I don't really need it. With things like the frame, trying to mount new control arms to it, there are just so many little things here and there that it make it a big pain to get accurate measurements on every surface. Same with the engine. You could make a crude engine model after a day of CAD, but then you forget some rib or bolt head and now your house is on fire and you're getting a divorce. There are other uses as well, like let's say you weld up a lower control arm and you want to make sure that the important points are where they're supposed to be. You can scan your part after it's done being made and compare it with your model. Since I got this thing, I don't measure anything even remotely complex anymore. I'm making a new transmission mount to lower the rear of the Viper transmission, and instead of measuring the mount, I just scanned the area and designed around the scan. This really is the next level of garage design and fabrication. For a project like the off-road Viper, it's a no-brainer, especially since I had the computer to begin with. If you're doing projects like this and you use CAD to design parts, it's probably worth the investment. If you don't use CAD, and if your projects are less ambitious, it might be overkill. I haven't tested the accuracy or repeatability of it. I have done tape measure checks, and it's certainly close enough for the kind of stuff that I do. But there are some videos out there that show it being within a couple of tenths of a millimeter. I've heard that this scanner is not great for small things like figures, though I haven't tried it myself. It's okay for whole cars as long as you don't have any really big flat surfaces, or you don't mind adding a ton of little reflective dots everywhere. But for the sort of intermediate stuff, axles and engines and uprights, it's fantastic, and it makes designing way easier. There are a few other scanners out there that cost a little bit less that I haven't used but have some good reviews. I'll link some videos in the description that go over some of them. I really like the Einstar, and I think we are at a moment in time where garage design and fabrication has really changed. Between this thing, low-cost hobby CAD, and Send Cut Send, I'm doing things in my garage that I was doing at big companies a few years ago with hundreds of thousands of dollars in equipment. For me, this is a better change than 3D printing or even CNC milling. What a great time to be in the garage. The world is always changing, and that's a good thing, as long as you keep up with it. If you're anything like me, you live by the algorithm. You love the algorithm. You don't know how the algorithm works. Fortunately, there is Brilliant, which has a whole course on algorithms, and probably more to the point, a course on neural networks. I can learn how this mysterious thing works by looking at pictures, puzzles, and diagrams, working at my own pace, and really understanding the concept. Brilliant teaches in a way that works with how I learn. They have subjects ranging from basic to advanced, so I can learn new things and brush up on old things I forgot. If you're a student, a professional, or just someone like me who loves to learn, check out Brilliant and see if it works for you. Try it free for 30 days by going to brilliant.org slash superfastmat or click the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. It used to be that you had to impress people to get people to watch your show. Now you just have to impress the algorithm. So do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. All hail the algorithm. <laughs>